Hello everyone and welcome to the ninth in the series of bite-sized training for all as part of the celebration of 50 years of the protection of Rex Act. I'm Peter Knott, Education Manager of the Nautical Archaeology Society. Today's webinar is Rec Research and Identification. The presenter is Becky Austin from MSTS Marine and Heritage. Uh, thank you very much all of you for coming to this bite-sized training talk about rec identification. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Becky Austin and I'm a senior project officer at MSDS Marine, which is a specialist marine contractor based in Derbyshire. My specialisms are in shipwreck legislation, marine heritage crime and wreck research. Prior to working at MSDS Marine, I was the deputy receiver of rec for the UK for just over a decade. This involved a huge amount of wreck research relating to hundreds of wrecks of all ages, sizes and nationalities with the main aim of identifying the site in order to find out who the owner was. That's my background, but I know that a lot of you probably already have a great deal of experience in researching wrecks. Those of you who are licensees are experts in your own sites and you'll know more about those sites than anyone, so I'm not here to teach people how to suck eggs. But whilst you have expertise in your particular wrecks, you may decide to look at other sites and find out a bit more about those. I hope that there'll be something useful in this talk for everyone. I'll go through which features to look for on the site, some desk-based research and how to go about it and where to look, and also, finally, a case study. It was only when I started writing this talk that I realised how difficult it is to make this bite-sized. It will be a challenge to cover this in a short space of time, and for that reason I'm going to focus on shipwrecks today, rather than including aircraft identification, as the majority of wrecks around our coast are ships. Also, this will be a very quick overview of the most useful and general advice that I think will help you to identify a wreck. At the end, I'll do a roundup with some tips and a bit more um, about things that you might find difficult, some um, important considerations and possible red herrings that you may come across. Wreck identification can be straightforward, but it can also be very complex. It can be quick, but it can also take years, or in many cases, it may never be possible. It all depends on the information that you have available to you from the wreck itself, the access you have to relevant documentation, and most importantly, how much time you have available. The process of identification is very much like a jigsaw. There are many aspects that you can research or record that will help you to piece together a picture of what you have. So what do you already know about the rec site? Have you recorded this and written it down in one place? What is it that you want to know? Is it just the name or the nationality or age of the ship? Or do you want to know about the events that led to the sinking? Do you want to find out about the people that were affected? There are pieces of legislation which might limit which activities can take place on a rec site. Be aware of which legislation applies to the site that you are looking at and make sure that you have any appropriate licenses for the activities that you're undertaking. If in doubt, seek advice or watch some of the previous bite-sized talks which are available on YouTube as some of these cover rec legislation. Make sure that you record what you find both on the rec and as part of your desk based research. You may have difficulty locating the information again, so it's good, a good idea to keep a record. And before you get too far into researching the wreck, just have a good check through to make sure it isn't already recorded somewhere. You don't want to waste lots of time doing something that's already been done. If you can't find it listed, or if it hasn't been named, then it's worth doing a little bit more research. Do you know how old the wreck is? Do you know the size of the wreck? This is obviously easier to measure on a fairly intact wreck, but it might be more difficult if the wreck is in sections or scattered. Do you know the nationality of the wreck? Is there any obvious cargo? If so, what is it? Which material is the wreck made of? What is the method of propulsion? When you know which questions you want to answer, you can plan what you want to record on your dives. So even if you have an idea of the identity, I'd say try to keep them an open mind. Many wrecks that were long thought to have been identified have later been discovered to be a different wreck. Try and make a basic site plan of the wreck site, including what you know already. This can be added to. It can just be a sketch and a log of what you saw. It doesn't need to be complicated. 
Things like GoPro footage and photos also make a useful addition when forming a site plan, as does photogrammetry, if this is something that you can do. Make a schedule of what you want to record on the upcoming dives. This will save you a lot of time in the long run. If you think training might be useful, have a look at upcoming courses which can be done in person or online. You can find a list of courses on the NAS website which you can get to by scanning this QR code. Also, look for examples of site plans online to get an idea of what you should be drawing. There are lots of useful resources to help you record what you find, and I'll talk about those a bit later. So before I go on, I just want to point out that it's rarely necessary to remove an item from the wreck to identify it. You can find out a lot from objects that are part of the wreck without removing them, by noting down details, measurements, or taking photographs of the objects or any markings. As you'll be aware, wreck sites vary significantly in terms of what remains. If you're a seasoned wreck diver, you've probably come across many of these components listed on this slide. When you dive a new site you want to identify, it can help to run through these criteria. Can you tell if it's a sailing vessel? And if so, are there any remains of rigging or hull? Which sorts of fixings were used? How large are the components? During the transition from sail to steam, some sailing ships also had small donkey boilers, which may be confusing, or dual power. So you might find steam engines um, features are present as well as sail. Or you might even find one wreck on top of another, which certainly is the case in a lot of places. If you're looking at a steamship, noting the number of boilers, the size of these, the type of engine, and the layout if they're still in their original position, could help to provide clues. Get to know your steam engines and how to identify various parts. Other engine room features like manufacturer's details, serial or yard numbers, or things like oil boxes, valves, and steam gauges can also help. Record the number of propellers and the configuration of the holds or other elements that still exist, if the ship's superstructure is still there, or the helm if that is still in place. So this is one of my favorite bits, which is the guns. Uh, some ships may have been armed, um, this doesn't necessarily mean that they were warships, as merchant ships also often carried guns for protection. So this includes pretty much any vessel that was used during a war effort. How a ship was armed can help to tell us a little bit more about that vessel, and they may be helpful with the identification. There are many types of cannon or gun. They are usually made of either bronze, iron, or a composite. Bronze guns can last very well underwater, especially if they've been covered with sediment. Iron guns do not do so well and are usually covered in concretion, and these suffer even more if taken out of the marine environment. For this reason, iron guns may not be able to offer you much further information in terms of their size or markings when they're concreted. However, still count them and try to note their distribution and rough size. Do not remove the concretion, as this exposes them to even more decay. Try to measure and sketch any guns that you have on your site. You may have a mixture of types of gun, for example, swivel guns, mortars, or larger guns. The NAS have a handy form on their website for recording these, which you can access through this QR code. It's definitely worth trying to draw the guns and any features that you have found as these sorts of details can be difficult to see from photographs sometimes. Some guns are in amazing condition and the details can clearly be seen even after hundreds of years underwater. Also, when you're looking at the guns, bear in mind that you might have found ones that weren't originally made for that vessel. Bronze guns especially, probably because of their value and their long service were often repurposed either from other vessels as prizes of war, or they were taken from land fortifications for use on ships. The Zurichsee gun was recovered during an enforcement case, and it was dated 1552 with the coat of arms of Zurichsee, a merman and a mermaid. It had originally been cast for the land fortifications of the town, but had later been repurposed for use on a ship. It was then taken as a prize by another vessel 
which just goes to show how much they can move around. The maker's name was also very clear on this gun, which had been cast by Remy de Hallett. Bronze guns were sometimes in service for over a hundred years, which can play havoc with your date ranges. There are so many different ways of measuring guns. If you're new to it, keep it simple and take the most useful measurements. Count how many guns of each type there are, and bear in mind that some may remain buried, some may have been jettisoned before sinking, and others may have been moved by trawling or salvage. Once you've recorded the positions in relation to the rest of the wreck, they may be able to tell you about how the ship sank, if they remain in the same position as they were when it sank in the first place. Also, look at the cascabels and trunnions to see if there are any markings or numbers, especially if your guns are upside down. And this is sort of something I'll repeat a lot, which is don't be afraid to ask an expert. You could ask your local museum to put you in touch with someone, or you could ask for help on social media, for example, on the Big Cannon project on Facebook. So onto other types of gun. First of all, the most important thing is stay well away from any munitions that you may um, find that might still be live. Do not touch them, and if they're found, report them to the Coast Guard. Weapons from World War I and World War II are usually a lot easier to identify as they were often clearly marked. Certainly, German U-boat propellers had dates on them and the name of the yard where they were constructed, um, which can really help. Um, but guns will often have a language on them that help you to identify uh, which nationality they were. Comparing the layout of the weapons on the wreck to any photos that exist of the ship can be really useful to help matching the placing of weapons. Also, record where the guns are in relation to the rest of the wreck. Are they still in situ or have they fallen off? How many are there? This diagram of a Liberty ship shows you how you can start to build up this information ready for research. So onto anchors. They're a common find on the seabed. Um, many of these will have been abandoned because they've been become fouled or caught, and so they may not be related to a wreck at all. Like other maritime technology, anchors have developed over time, from stone anchors to the anchor shapes that we're all familiar with. If you have an anchor on the site that you're researching, you should measure it as accurately as possible, take a photo and note any unusual features, as well as its position in relation to the rest of the wreck. You can usually tell how an anchor was used by the number of flukes, the position of it and the size. For instance, anchors where one fluke has been removed or bent were used as mooring anchors for buoys. The QR code on the slide links to the Big Anchor Project, which has freely available recording forms and information on different types of anchor. Be sure to add your anchor to the Big Anchor Project when you've measured it. Also, um, take a note of the number of anchors present and their position in relation to the rest of the wreck. So, ship spells. You might think that these are quite simple. They're a favourite for identifying wrecks, as some will have a name on, and well, that's that sort of job done, isn't it? Well, not necessarily. Many will have a name on them, but bear in mind that these may have been reused on another ship. If you find a bell with a name on, brilliant. This could save you a lot of work, but do continue to record and research other details to make sure these support your identification. You may find that there's no name on the bell, but you can still find out a lot from other features. Sometimes features can indicate a nationality and the age of the wreck from the style and shape. They'll often have a date or a maker's mark, or sometimes a dedication or a phrase. Some ships, especially more recent ones, had more than one bell, so they could have had one on deck and one in the wheelhouse and so on. Many French and Italian bells, especially 17th and 18th century styles, usually have a slightly different fixing, confusingly known as the cannons, which was more of a loop than the lattice shape favoured by the British. And a bit like bronze guns, they're made out of the, a very similar material. They can last for hundreds of years underwater, and so they're often one of the biggest clues if they are still on the wreck. So let's move on to some other features that could help you to identify a wreck. 
these are all things that you can search for when you plan a dive. There are, of course, endless roads to go down in terms of what you can look for. And I could be here for weeks, so I have tried to cover the main features that might be most useful. Other objects that can aid identification include telegraphs, which often have serial numbers on. But sadly, a lot of records relating to this no longer exist. Um, engine components often have serial numbers or dates. Make sure you look at different components as several are likely to have markings. Winches and windlasses may have maker's plates, but also the style might be identifiable from photographs if they exist. Decorative features can also help, especially if they're fairly unique. Portholes generally aren't much help, but sometimes you might be very lucky and find an ornate version. The shape of the wreck itself could provide a clue as well, and the position of um, cargo winches and lifeboat davits or the wheelhouse all add to the picture. Ballast is often something that survives well, and it can be the only remaining part of a wreck. Bear in mind that all sorts of materials were used as ballast. Heavy cargo might have been used, and older iron, including disused guns, just to add to the confusion. Iron cannon used for ballast usually had one or both trunnions removed so that they could no longer be used as weapons. But basically, anything that has writing on it, on it gives us something to research. And then that leads us into objects. General objects carried on the ship. These might be cargo or they could be uh, ship's provisions. Either way, if you can find out more about what the ship was carrying, this might help point you to an identity. Glass bottles often have marks or writing impressed on them. A seal might relate to the owner of the bottle or the wine merchant where it was purchased. If there are no markings, the shape of the bottle might also help to indicate an age. The picture in the middle of the slide shows how the shape of glass bottles has changed over time. The same can be said for ceramics. Style and shape can indicate age, but can't always be relied on. If you find a maker's mark on a plate or cup, then this might help. Some, helpfully, even have shipping lines, which is a fantastic clue. Whether a piece of ceramic is hand-painted or transferware can also provide an indication of age. Coins can help too with age, ages, um, but often several different currencies can be found and this may have been used for trade. They may also be able to give you a date range um, and an idea of the last voyage or regular routes. Metal ingots will also often have a stamp or an assay mark on them, which will show where they were smelted or who was shipping them. Metal tableware can also help if it has a pewterous mark or engraving. If any carvings or decorations remain, and you're lucky to find these on a site, um, these could possibly provide a clue. Some records do exist of carvings commissioned, especially for naval ships, but also artwork like this by Van der Velde the Elder exist in national collections and they can help you to identify any wooden carvings. The style of the object itself might also help to narrow down a date range, an age range too. Where decoration is concerned though, you do need to remember that some styles have seen several revivals. So other marks and clues. Um, I love pictures like this of the maker's marks and the pewterers. Um, they're one of my favourite things to research, but they're also one of the most difficult. <laughs> um, they can really take you down some rabbit holes. There are some marks that I've seen that stay with me and I'll forever be trying to find out what they are. And by the way, if anyone knows what this Elizabeth Elizabethan mark is at the bottom of the slide with the upside down shield and the RT, do you let me know? Most people are aware that broad arrows are a good sign that what you have found belonged to the Royal Navy, and you can find these objects regularly from the 17th century onwards. Some organisations had a symbol or mark. Bear in mind when you get to research these that they might not have remained the same the whole time. The same can be said about coats of arms, which often evolved over the years. If you can't take a photo, do try to draw a sketch so that the mark stays fresh and that you don't have to dive again to remind yourself of what it looks like. A photograph might not show up that well underwater. So cargoes can sometimes last longer than other components of a wreck, and they may be the only remaining clue to the ship's history. 
These cannon were carried as a cargo on their way to India. They were actually field artillery for the United East India Company, and all were in a brand new condition when they were found. We were able to narrow down which ships they might have been on due to their location, the crest and their age. And as you can see, this one's marked with the date 1807, and they also have the maker's name Wigan and Graham on them. The wheel wreck is a protected wreck of the Isles of Scilly, and as you can see from the photograph, it was carrying a cargo of mining equipment, and it's thought to be, thought to be a mid-19th century wreck. The cargo is nearly all that remains of this particular wreck. So there are a lot of words here, and don't worry, I'm not going to read all of these out as we could be here forever, but you could take a screenshot or photo of this list and then you can refer to it later if that's helpful. Desk-based research is something that I particularly enjoy um, and you never know where it's going to take you. Once you've gathered plenty of information from your rec site, it's time to get a large cup of tea and make yourself comfortable. The next bit is the thing that can take an awful lot of time and patience. There are so many places to look and I can't list them all in one slide. As with all sources that you consult, please do think about who wrote it and how accurate it might be. Otherwise, it could end up sending you in the wrong direction. Even sources that seem incredibly reliable have mistakes. If you're searching the name of a vessel, do bear in mind that there might have been more than one with that name at the same period in time, and even more confusingly, it might have been lost in a similar or unknown area. I've certainly come across that recently with a wreck in the North Sea. Generally, the fastest, cheapest and most convenient way to search for information is on the internet. If you end up searching a number of words or objects, it might be handy to put the search criteria that you've already looked at in a spreadsheet so you don't waste time doing the same searches again. Some ships have annoyingly common names or have commonly used words such as monarch. Try searching for years alongside these or even 19th century or the century you're looking for and including other details like the general location. Start your search by looking at nationally held or locally held official records such as the National Archives or any of the regional lists. Find out which local historic environment records office is nearest to your rec site and search for local losses. If you have an idea of where the ship was registered, you can search there too. And you can narrow down your search if you have a rough idea of when it sank. But for this, to start off with, do you keep time margins generous unless you've got a good idea of the time of loss? Most of these sources have collections that can be searched for free online. If you require copy sending to you electronically, there'll often be a charge but it might still be cheaper than visiting in person, depending on how local you are to the records office. If there are any, look at reports written about other rec sites that are similar to yours. You may find that they discovered similar things. This could be any recs worldwide, if you think your site might be an ocean-going vessel. Look for journal articles that have been written about these. Lloyd's Register Foundation has a brilliant website where you can search for losses and for some vessels it has other useful information like blueprints, ships plans and correspondence relating to builds and surveys. British History Online is a great resource especially if you are looking for really early documents. The state papers often reported the loss of a ship, especially warships. Bear in mind that the area it sank in might have had a different name or may have been spelt differently then. Some documents on here are freely available, but others you do need to pay a subscription to access. The same can be said for the British Newspaper Archive, which has copies of newspapers going back to the 1700s, but there is a subscription fee for this. There's a whole host of regional and national newspapers available to search, and I have found this a really useful resource for tracking down shipwrecks that aren't recorded anywhere else. The London Gazette can be accessed for free, and contains copies going back to 1665. It is a national record, so it doesn't just cover London, but it reports on some international shipping incidents. Newspapers often hold details of journeys, battles, or of ships returned to port and ships missing, as well as adverts for goods or passage. 
if all else fails, and I certainly have um, resorted to this, you can consider thinking about looking at burial records in the area near to the shipwreck if they go back that far. Museums are also brilliant visual references. So if there's one that might have items of a similar age or a historic ship, consider going to have a look at these as it can help get to grips with the orientation of the wreck. Many books that are out of print and past copyrights are available on websites such as archive.org or Project Gutenberg. And if you think a particular book might be useful, search for it on Google Books to see if it is, there is an electronic copy before you try and buy one. MSDS Marine have a library which is available to protected rec licensees or volunteers who work in the marine historic environment. And you can search the catalogue online and request a copy if it's not available electronically. Do email us if you find something that you think might be useful and you can search the MSDS Marine Library catalogue by using this QR code. Also, see what's available through your local library. They may not have a copy, but they can usually do interlibrary loans for a small fee, which is usually cheaper than travelling. So if you find components or maker's marks that you can research, it can be a mixed experience. Firstly, if it's not part of the ship, all the objects might be able to tell you is to help give you an idea of the age or nationality. So think about how much time you want to dedicate to searching on these particular objects. Some manufacturers hold comprehensive archives and others none at all. Some have well-recorded and researched histories and others might have been too short-lived or obscure to be recorded. But don't give up, there are still some good places to look. Finding a maker's mark is exciting, but it can be equally disappointing when you can't identify it. Books are brilliant for identifying marks, but some are expensive and difficult to get hold of. I regularly keep an eye out for bargains in secondhand bookshops or on eBay, but unless you want to specialise in research, it might be easier to borrow a book from a library. There are plenty of books out there about merchant's marks, glass sealed bottles, pewter and silver marks. There are also some websites that specialise in particular eras or object types. For example, the Victorian Collections website is a brilliant resource, as is Grace's Guide to British Industrial History, which also usually provides a list of useful sources you can go to for more information. These websites are particularly useful as they often have pictures and list when and if company names changed over the years, and sometimes they also include company logo changes. They also sometimes list old patents, which can be helpful. A research William Harvey and Co, which is in the picture here of the Grace's Guide, um, as someone contacted me to find out if a particular lamp might have been from a named wreck. And by researching the make, it could clearly be determined that the lamp would not have been from that wreck as the company didn't exist then. So researching military wrecks, there are many sources for military records. Um, a large number of records are held by the National Archives in Kew. Their catalogue catalog is online and you can request copies, but you may have to pay for these and it isn't always obvious what they will include. So you might have to take a bit of a gamble. Navy Historical Branch based in Portsmouth is home to a large archive of operational history, including things like vitulling lists, diaries and logs. Contact them if you think they might hold something that would help. The Royal Armouries might also be able to assist with gun identification and you can search their collection online. I have managed to identify similar guns using their catalogue. The Caird Library at Royal Museums Greenwich houses a multitude of marine information. This includes some military information such as Admiralty movement books, but also some really fantastic documents like this sketch and description of the Dutch Smyrna fleet. Anyone can apply for a reader's ticket and this can be done in advance. And you can then order the documents you would like to view so that they're ready when you arrive. The Maritime Archaeology Sea Trust, MAST, also put together the Royal Navy Lost List, which is exactly what it says, and contains vessels lost between 1512 and 2004, and this is available on MAST's website. 
And if naval history is your particular area of interest, you could also consider joining the Navy Record Society. They have a whole host of information on their website and also have forums where you can ask other members for help or share your knowledge. If you need to research records in a different country, this can be a bit more of a challenge. Researching in a language that you don't speak is obviously a lot more difficult. Use the tools you have available to you as much as you can, like the translate option on the browser or copying and pasting into Google. This isn't always straightforward, especially if you're going further back in time when people spoke in a different way. Added to this, if the text is old, then it can really take a long time to work out the letters and spellings, which were often different, and sometimes also they use shorthand. You can also get the Google Translate app, and you can use the camera on your phone to translate script that you can't copy and paste, but this will only work if your phone can recognise the letters. Most countries will have their own national archive like we do, and also just like we have a newspaper archive, many other countries do too. Learn the words that you're looking for in that language, for example, Dutch, and then use the search and the date options to narrow down your search. If you think you have an idea of the ship you're trying to find out about, then you can search that name, but remember that spellings weren't always standardised. The photograph here, if you can just about make it out, it shows the maker's mark of Wolf Wilhelm Huss, who was from a family famous for trumpet making in Germany in the 17th and 18th centuries. I found his maker's mark, um, which confusingly uses his father's initials in a journal about historical musical instruments. Not able to leave that alone, I wondered who might have played it and if it was recorded anywhere. So if you look at the document on the left, um, this is from the VOC pay books and it lists the names of the name of the trumpeter who was on the Roosevike, which is where the trumpet was from. Um, his name was Anthony Tasfier. And I found this by translating trumpeter into Dutch, which is not that different from trumpeter as we would say it, it's trompetta, and then searching this within the Roosevike pay books. This popped up quite easily, so this was a bit of an easy win, but it's not always that easy. But it did feel brilliant to be able to think about Anthony trumpeting the crew to their stations. Right, don't be scared of this slide. There's a lot of writing, um, but you don't have to read it all. I will go through it. Um, I, this is a case study which I thought I would use to show you where information comes from and how I found it to support different um, wrecks and, and look into which um, wreck identification. So this is a case study where the name was discovered. But um, at the end of um, the road, when it, what, what is it that really is the identity of a wreck? Is it just a name or is it the story of the wreck itself that is the full identity? So you've, you've probably already heard a lot about this wreck already but I wanted to demonstrate where the information on a wreck like this can be found and how easily it can be accessed. So yeah, I know there's a lot of words on here, but I'm gonna go through the main points. In 2019, a new wreck was discovered off the coast of Eastbourne by um, dive boat skipper Dave Ronan and recreational divers Tom Stockman and Graham Owen. The first discovery was the huge marble blocks on the site, followed by iron and bronze guns. Subsequent dives revealed uh, letters and numbers on the bronze guns, and these were the start of finding out more about the wreck. The NAS were invited to dive the site, and I volunteered to carry out some of the initial research. During this time, the site was made a protected wreck, and Mark B.T. Edwards from the NAS and David Ronan are now licensees of the site. So two of the bronze on the, on the wreck site, the bronze guns, had clear markings, and they had dates of 1670. So that helps narrow it down the era that you're looking for. Although obviously a hundred years after that could be possible or even more in some cases. They also had the coat of arms of the Admiralty of Rotterdam and the maker's name Cornelius Uderog. The iron guns were too concreted to extract information from. The two, so the two bronze guns were pointing towards the wreck being that of a 17th century Dutch vessel from the Admiralty of Rotterdam. There have been quite a few battles in the English Channel which the wreck could have been connected to, but the maker's name and the date really helped to narrow it down to a few candidates. With that in mind, I took my own advice and I contacted um, an expert. It's a colleague in the Netherlands called Nico Brink, who's an expert in Dutch guns. 
He was very excited by the discovery, and he soon narrowed it down to one possible ship, the Klein Hollandia, which means the Little Holland. And you might think, that's it, identity done. But is that really all you want to know? Many of you may have already heard the history behind this wreck, but I thought I might go through it with reference to the sources where some of the information comes from. The Klein Hollandia was part of a fleet of Dutch ships returning from Smyrna, now part of modern day Turkey in 1672, and on the 12th of March was attacked by a fleet of English ships in the Channel. The Dutch and the English were supposed to be in peacetime, but the English fleet attacked the Dutch without provocation, sparking the start of the Third Anglo-Dutch War. The attack was mentioned in the state papers on the 15th of March 1672, um, which you can see on the left hand side. Um, it provides some ideas on the timing of events and the English version of what happened. You'll notice from all the sources that the numbers and accounts vary a little. The state papers suggest it was armed with 46 guns and the London Gazette says 44. Other Dutch sources suggest 44. You'll, you see these are marked in red where it says about the guns. Um, so the, the Klein Hollandia was going to be um, departing the Mediterranean and there was a report made on it then in the state papers as well, but that time saying it had 76 guns, 12 iron guns and the rest brass. So these vary significantly. Information about the cargo I've highlighted in yellow. So although the Klein Hollandia was a warship, it also carried some of the cargo, which we know from the initial dives on the site included marble. Knowing that the fleet stopped in a location in Italy famed for this type of marble helped tick a box. And as you can see from the newspaper clip in the centre of the slide, the fleet's cargo was recorded in the London Gazette on the 25th of March. This extract relates to a report received from The Hague on March the 19th. It says that five of the merchant ships with the richest cargo were taken by the English and that they were laden with silks and other rich commodities. Now, you may have noticed that the date of the London Gazette is dated 25th of March and the report is dated from the 29th. This particular issue covered news from the 21st to the 25th of March. And so this is probably a misprint and should be read as the 19th. And this is a good example of making sure you check the accuracy of the source. This next issue of the London Gazette, which is underneath, um, which is for news dated up to the 28th, details more about the Dutch crew that escaped, who managed to land at Dover and report from Maastricht, and a report from Maastricht which stated that the goods lost from the fleet amounted to a million guilders. The Dutch records reported that this action by the English had not achieved much, and that's the information that's on the right of the screen. Um, the Dutch naval commander Cornelius Johan de Witt wrote to his brother, uh, sorry, yeah, Cornelius Johan de Witt wrote to his brother Johan about the event, saying that England had finally taken down its mask and that this led to the war. 1672 in the Netherlands was known as the disaster year, and five months later the two brothers were brutally ex executed in a gruesome public lynching with acts of cannibalism. Both the Dutch and the English accounts provide helpful information about the events that led to the loss of the ship, and these are the bits that I've highlighted in blue. So if, if you want to know how I accessed the um, Amsterdam Gazette, this was through the online Dutch archive called Delpha, which is freely available. This report is from slightly later um, than the London Gazette and the State Papers in April, but it provides the Dutch version of events. And you'll notice that it's in French, and that supports what I said in the last slide about language. Whilst Google Translate can help form a picture, if your language skills are lacking and you're serious about research, it might be worth getting some practice in. I'm constantly trying to improve my skills, which are absolutely rubbish. The Dutch account gives further information on the combat and the damage to the Klein Hollandia. I particularly like the reference to it leaking like a sieve. So a nice slide now with not so many words on. Um, I just wanted to touch on artwork. The famous saying, a picture paints a thousand words is very true. The picture you see on the left is a tiny painting of the attack on the Dutch fleet with notations relating to the vessels and the captains. I should point out that when we arranged to visit this at Greenwich, in my head, I thought this picture would be about at least sort of A3 equivalent in size, when actually when we arrived and saw it, it was more of an A5 sort of size picture. 
So we took photos that we could zoom in on and after the um, and so we could alter the settings as well. And that way we might be able to be better able to read the details. It is, however, a useful resource and provides a fantastic idea of the scene, although it was likely painted after the event and therefore may not be accurate. The artist is unknown, but I think that the signature says Lehman's and what looks like an R is actually a stylized A for Antonius, who was a Dutch Golden Age painter from 1631 to 1673. And that's a perfect example of how I can end up going down rabbit holes because I just love trying to solve a mystery. The other painting on the right is also part of the collection at the Royal Museum's Greenwich, but it was on display when we visited. It shows um, Holmes and Holes. And have you noticed what they're wearing? So I should point out that, that Holmes and Holes were um, captains of some of the English ships. But yeah, they're not wearing naval uniforms. And that's really one very fancy looking hat. In the background, you might not be able to make it out, but where the blue arrow is, there's a sea battle and Holmes is casually resting on a cannon. Hull's lost left arm in a previous, oh, Hull's lost his left arm in a previous battle, but the sword he's holding doesn't look English either. And this painting is thought to commemorate the attack on the Smyrna fleet. They're wearing fine silks and a hat that is Turkish in style, as is the sword. I contacted an expert in Peter Lilly Artworks um, because that's who, who painted this particular uh, picture. But he was quick to point out that Lily favoured painting his citizen silk and that they might have been wearing classical dress to give them a timeless appearance. But I still like the idea that they were showing off by wearing their prizes. So delving deeper into the identity of the Klein Hollandia revealed its fascinating history. Bearing in mind the Klein Hollandia sank in 1672, there's a great deal of information available about the events that led to its demise. The ongoing research by the rest of the team has been fantastic, and if you want to find out more, there's been a lot of media coverage, including all of the other fascinating details that the team have, has discovered since. So I thought um, it might be useful to just go through a few skills and tips that might be useful along the way in your research. Firstly, if you want to be a good researcher, you need to be someone who's determined. Remember, don't just search the exact date. News sometimes took time to reach the shore, and so search around the dates the event happened. Being organised can save you a lot of time and money. Look to see what's available online and for free. And if you do decide to travel to an archive or a records office, carry out a thorough search of what is available first using online catalogues and list the documents that you think might be useful. Even if you're not certain about some of them, list them anyway, as it's better to check than to have to go back again. As I mentioned before, check your sources and also look for others that might prove or disprove what you have found. Don't be too confident in your identification. Keep an open mind and find as much evidence as you can. Make sure you keep a record of the information you find, when you accessed it and how to find it again. You never know, you might one day want to write a paper on it. Um, and also think about paleography. It's the reading and translating of old text. Some older texts are definitely easier than others, but there are some brilliant online guides available to help you. And although it's really tough translating some of these documents, it is really rewarding because you never know when you might discover or read something that no one else has found. And don't forget, this can be even more of a challenge if it's in a different language like Latin. And that brings me on to the other useful skill, which we mentioned already, languages. Um, make Google Translate your friend, but even better, make friends with people who can speak different languages that can help you <laughs> or speak languages yourself. So another thing that can help is knowing a little bit about heraldry, particularly when you're trying to search for an image, because if you can describe it properly, it will save you a lot of time. So every town and maker and village used to have some sort of logo or crest, just as we do now but the older ones are a little bit more difficult to identify. So like I say, learn how to describe what you can see in the logo or coat of arms using the heraldry terminology and put this into a picture search. There are lots of sources online that can teach you about heraldry. And I keep saying it and I'll say it again, but ask people who know about these things. By experts, I don't just mean academics. Ask local dive groups, museums, local history groups, or anyone else that has discovered things at or near the site. 
there are so many brilliant online courses out there too. Some of them are even free and you can do um, them when and is, is best for you and when you've got time. So make use of those and add to your research skills. So you'll be pleased to hear that I've nearly finished. I didn't want to end this without going over some tips, um, further tips and thinking about some red herrings or barriers. Do be mindful of red herrings. These can include vessels of the same name from a similar time or similar vessels lost in the same location or even wrecks lying on top of each other. Also be mindful that there was propaganda even in early warfare, so try and find accounts from both sides or from neutral nations. Do be prepared for disappointment. There are huge numbers of records that have been lost to war or to fire over the centuries. It doesn't mean that the information definitely isn't out there. You may be able to find it somewhere else, but that's not always the case. Also, think about how much you're willing to pay to do your research. It can be costly. Some books are free online if you want to search for them, and but signing up to lots of online sources can also be very expensive. Think about whether it would be worth travelling to London to carry out research, whether it would be better to request and pay for copies to be sent to you. When I carry out research, I also think it's really important to try and remember the human aspect to shipwrecks. Yes, the ships are incredible feats of engineering and skill, but I think that looking back at the records really help us to think about the people who made these ships, who sailed them, and those who were lost in them. And my final point, and really it's one that I need to remember, is know when to stop. Stopping is not the same as giving up, though. Think about how much time you have to devote to your project. When are you going to stop looking? New information does come to light all the time, but I think you'll know when you've exhausted your search. Or if you think you haven't, it might be time to pass it to somebody else to have a look, as they might come up with some different ideas. So I think all I have to say now is good luck. Um, and if I can help in any way to point you in the right direction, please do get in touch and I'll be happy to provide some ideas. Thank you very much, Becky. That was amazing. My, my head is brimming full of information. Uh, definitely picked up some tips there. I will say that for anyone else who's feeling a little bit overwhelmed by some of the resources that Becky has thrown at us, we will be putting them together in a fact sheet, which will be attached to the YouTube recording. So don't feel too overwhelmed. Just uh, keep all of that in mind. And there's lots of amazing resources out there. And thank you very much to Becky for bringing those to light. I'd also like to thank Historic England for ensuring that these bite-sized webinars are free for everyone to attend and watch online whenever they like. Uh, if you are interested in historic human remains in the marine environment and how to deal with them respectfully, then please join us for our next webinar and enjoy the rest of your day.